I'm sure you've seen the ads. A ship of pristine whiteness atop a sea of azure blue, the epitome of luxury, a dream of unbridled pleasure, if only you could afford it. Well, David Foster Wallace could afford it because Harper's Magazine commissioned him to write about it, and the result was the title essay in his book, A Supposedly Fun Thing I'll Never Do Again. As you might guess from the title, for Wallace, luxury didn't translate directly into pleasure. Steve Paulson asked him to read a brief summary of the trip straight out of the book. I have seen a lot of really big white ships. I have seen schools of little fish with fins that glow. I have seen a toupee on a 13-year-old boy. The glowing fish like to swarm between our hull and the cement of the pier whenever we docked. I have seen the north coast of Jamaica. I have seen and smelled all 145 cats inside the Ernest Hemingway residence in Key West, Florida. I now know the difference between straight bingo and prizo and what it is when a bingo jackpot, quote, snowballs. I have seen camcorders that practically required a dolly. I've seen fluorescent luggage and fluorescent sunglasses and fluorescent pince-nez and over 20 different makes of rubber thong. I have heard steel drums and eaten conch fritters and watched a woman, conch fritters, I think that would be, and watched a woman in silver lame projectile vomit inside a glass elevator. I have pointed rhythmically at the ceiling to the 2-4 beat of the exact same disco music I hated pointing at the ceiling to in 1977. This doesn't exactly sound like a fun experience, uh, was it? It was an experience where you were so relentlessly and bombarded so relentlessly bombarded by the attentions of people whose high-paid job was to make sure you were having fun that to say whether it was fun or not, it ends up becoming meaningless. It was fun with a capital F in ITAL with quotes around it, and uh, it was kind of crazy-making. I should also add, I went on this thing by myself, and I and a very troubled man who was surgically attached to a camcorder... (laughs) We're the only two people on this cruise who were not there as part of a couple, and I think it would have been very different for me if I'd had someone to, quote-unquote, share the experience with. So you were a, a duck out of water there. In more ways than one. But I have to say, you don't seem like a cruise kind of guy. I'm not sure what a cruise kind of guy is. I know they had at first wanted me to do a singles cruise, and the Harper's editor and I decided that that would be... I mean, the big problem with this is it's very easy just to be mean, right? Let's let's make some very easy, mordant comments about sybaritic pleasure and commercial American culture. And what we, what we settled for was on um, the celebrity cruises, which, as they like to call themselves, they are sort of the Sony and Cadillac of the industry. They offer a more, somewhat more refined, less distasteful cruise, that, the big feature of which is they apparently have a four- or five-star chef in the kitchen. And many of, their, many of the cruisers were people in their late 40s and 50s and 60s. Well, give me a sense of the luxury on a cruise like this. How, how far does it go? Well, this is sort of the fantasy vacation, and what it promises you is you're not going to have any problems on this. I mean, it got to, you know, you're sunning. You're sunning in a chair, but it's not a regular chair at a pool. It's a specially designed chair with a special material that absorbs your perspiration as you're perspiring so you don't get those hideous, you know, those sounds when you sweat on a plastic lounge chair and then shit. You don't get that. They're (laughs) incredible. They're towels that you, you know, want to have personal relationships with, and they're all stacked, you know, near this towel bin, and you don't have to get the towel. A swarthy person brings the towel to you, except at a certain point it got absurd because their idea was you were were always going to want a fresh towel, and they also didn't want towels laying around because that's not luxurious, so they would remove the towels the minute you were done with them, which meant if you got out of the chair and, like, just for a second, you know, wanted to smoke a cigarette over the port railing, you would turn back, well, the towel's gone, and your chair is now refolded to the same perfect design it was when you started with. And then if you start to move the chair, the guy has a heart attack and runs over because, of course, now you're doing something and he wants to do it for you. So it sort of, it ends up being sort of like staying with, you know, the over-solicitous host who wants to do absolutely everything for you and you end up in these really Abbott and Costello, um, you know, do you carry your own tray in the cafeteria or do you let this guy who's 80 years old and clearly has terrible (laughs) arthritis carry your tray for you? Well, you feel horribly guilty if you let him carry the tray, but if you carry your own tray, it turns out he gets in trouble for having let you carry his tray. I mean, it was a nightmare of a very particular sort. So you must have felt watched constantly, for one thing, that you could never do anything uh, without being observed. This is what it really is. I mean, this is not by no means profound. It's utterly, it, it 
infantilizes you. You have no problems. You don't even get to think about the problems because the minute the problem occurs to you, it's been solved by somebody, you know, who's making 50 cents an hour. I found it uncomfortable. What interested me is that most of the other cruisers didn't. And at the start of the cruise, it occurred, uh, my thought was, oh, they're stupid or they're really selfish. The fact of the matter was, is there was a certain muscle that was required for not going into paroxysms of guilt and self-consciousness every time, you know, it was, it was one of these people, look, we're paying for this. Uh, this is how they make their living. We're going to let them do it. Uh, and I'm going to enjoy this week and then go back to the real world. I ended up thinking there was a kind of mental muscle they used to sort of block out the absurdity of it. And I know that um, there were a lot of really smart, cool people on this cruise, and everybody else had a much better time than I did. What about just the places that you went? I mean, around the Caribbean and, you know, seeing the the deep blue sea. I I mean, I ended up feeling unbelievable stress because this stuff was so pretty that pretty much all you could do is sunset rave using stock phrases from like Keats poems or, or whatever. I ended up by the end deciding that the perfect adjective for it was that it looked really expensive. And, and that's what it looked like. I mean, it was not your ordinary kelp-strewn, green, menacing-looking ocean around here. The ocean looked computer-enhanced. It was sort of like everything was a postcard. Yeah, yeah. You really got the sense that hordes of extremely low-paid third-world people worked frantically at night to make the thing as pretty as it was, which, which for me was not an entirely comfortable sense. You write about your accommodations and, uh, and how you were quite taken by the bathroom in your cabin. Well, it was a really outstanding bathroom. I don't know what you'd like me to say. <laughs> what made it outstanding? Oh, lordy. Um, well... It had really interesting light. It had fluorescent light put through some kind of odd diffusion filter that made you look slightly better looking than you really were in the mirror. This was interesting. The soap dish... I mean, all this stuff is going to seem really banal to anybody else, but the soap dish, you know how you get that that soggy underside of the bar because it sits there and it's water in the soap dish? The cruise line has a striated soap dish. The soap dish has a kind of mesh and then a receptacle underneath that. So the soap itself sits in dry air and is allowed to stay dry, which which extends its life twice. <laughs> Plus, it also, the, 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 the very coolest thing about this, which I thought was neat, and then all these people wrote, wrote to me after the magazine article, I guess it's not that uncommon. It had a vacuum toilet. All right. Not only did you flush the toilet, but you you, you hit this button, and there was a sound. Uh, yeah. There was a sound as if God Himself was sucking on a straw, and whatever you had expelled was removed from you with a force that made you feel confident that wherever it was it was ending up was really far away from you and utterly sterilized and like you know boiled down to some kind of totally innocuous material. The the force on the vacuum toilet was a little scary, and maybe that's all I'll say. But the bathroom just seemed to me to be. Kind kind of like a synecdoche of the whole thing. It was so incredibly luxurious and so incredibly cool that it ended up creeping you out. I ended up fearing my toilet. Which, you might, you might get sucked down there with it. Uh, at, the very, at the very least, you fear being sucked down. <laughs> well, and it sounds like not only the bathroom was immaculately clean, but the whole thing was clean. The whole ship was, was spotless. Yeah. And look, here's my concern is on the radio, it sounds like I'm complaining about this. I'm not complaining about it. It was absolutely incredible. It was like getting to be a slob and having, you know, a mother on crystal meth running around behind you cleaning up all the time. But there were weird things like they would clean the room if I was gone out of the room more than half an hour, but not if I was out of the room less than half an hour. Well, that's really neat for the first two days until it occurs to you. How do they know when you leave the room that you're going to be gone for more than half an hour? So there were, and there's some of the stuff in the essay had all these elaborate strategies for how to test them and how to, gonna, how to catch the cleaning woman yeah. in, in the act i never caught her in the act whenever I, I could be gone for 31 minutes i would come back the room was sterilized we're talking <laughs> odorless the room militarily you know the bed militarily made up um and a mint on the pillow i mean i have i still have mints from this cruise because every time i would leave the room i would come back and there would be a mint very very cool except how do they know i'm going to be gone for more than half an hour do they track me do i have some kind of device on me i don't know about I was I was checking for surveillance. I was, and of course, all the other passengers, these poor people who were just trying to have a good time, to not want me coming up to them, you know, asking how on earth they know they're gone for more than half an hour. Their response was, "Why are you worrying about this? It's designed for our comfort. We've paid enormous amounts of money for this. Why don't you just, you know, relax and enjoy it?" Will you ever go on another cruise? No. 
No. Why not? Why not? It, even not as a journalist? I think I just have certain neurological problems. It, this used to happen to me. It's why I don't particularly like to go to parties. Anytime where somebody says, patweet, they blow the whistle, we're now having fun with the capital S. It's time to have fun. We're going to sit around talking about how much fun we're having. Here are these people who are being paid to increase the, your total levels of fun. I get some little kid, part of me sticks out its lower lip and says, no, damn you, I'm not going to have fun. And I'm going to, the venues where I have fun are the ones where I'm not supposed to have fun, and so I'm going to avoid all venues where fun is part of the contract. 